So, Father, this morning we're thankful for your love for us. We're thankful uh, that you're smiling at us. And, God, as we come in this morning, maybe not feeling like we're worthy of your smile, thank you for your grace. Grace changes everything. And so thank you for that grace this morning as we begin our time just to honor and to glorify you first and foremost. Be exalted in our midst this day, God. That's our desire. Uh, This morning, if you wouldn't mind turning in your Bibles to the book of Acts, where we pick up, uh, where we'll end Paul's third missionary journey, Acts chapter 21. Um, As you're turning there, um, this Wednesday, uh, Carl's not able to do the midweek, so I'm going to cover for him this week. So I look forward to seeing those of you who come out (coughs) to the midweek at 6.30 at the (coughs) greatest gift in Scripture Supply on 6th and 5th and Grand. Grand. Well, you can go to 6th and Grand, but you won't be there. So, 5th and Grand. What's that? You'll be at Meineke, yes. Let's go ahead and stand together. Acts chapter 21, beginning at verse 1. Now it came to pass that when he had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to Kaz and the following day to Rhodes and from there Patara and finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. When he had come to the end of those days, we departed and we went our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. When we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemaeus, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. And on the next day, we, we were Paul's companions, departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. And Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And so when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's living and active. Thank you that it is solid truth, 24-7, 365, for all of eternity. And so as we turn to your word this day, we ask you, Holy Spirit, change us from the inside out. Plant this deep within our hearts. Make us to be more like Jesus, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Anybody ever hear of a man by the name of Bishop Wright in the uh, mid to late 1800s, United States? Anybody? You'll probably pick up on this pretty quick because the story is pretty short. One day from his pulpit, he announced that heavier than air flight will never happen because it goes against the will of God. Here's a well-intentioned preacher making a statement that heavier than air flight will never ever happen because it's impossible and it goes against the will of God. Bishop Wright ended up having a few children, four boys. Two of them happened to be named Orville and Wilbur. (laughs) Bishop Wright believed in his heart that he was right when in actuality he was wrong. The will of the Lord is something that is often revealed in the midst of some of God's people stating very clearly that that's not the will of the Lord. 
We have to be careful. And as we look at this today in a message that's called The Will of the Lord Be Done, we need to be very, very careful concerning what it is that we proclaim to others obviously is the will of the Lord or obviously isn't. Because sometimes in our humanity, we're wrong. I think that is just hilarious, right? That this guy gets up in his pulpit. He was not only just a pastor, he was actually elevated to the status of bishop of an area. And not only did he say it, he had a publication. He, it's in print for all posterity to read that the father of Wilbur and Orville actually said that what they ended up doing for the first time on planet Earth was actually against the will of God. It wasn't true. The will of the Lord be done. We pick this up, and I know the beginning of this chapter, as we're reading through it, you're going, wow, this is like, Paul's all over the place. Look at this map. When Paul said when we had departed from them in this place where he went, this is the same map before, and these are some of my favorite maps. If you ever want to look at maps, it's from a website called uh, conformingtojesus.com. I'm, I'm only endorsing the maps I haven't read a lot of what else is on there, but the maps I think are great because I don't know about you, but I'm kind of a visual learner. But what I love most about this is that they give you starting points and where he's actually going, as you can tell by the arrows, but then they also give you the scriptures that are actually there. So it's telling you what happened at these places. What I find most interesting about this is that as you can see here in what's... Israel down here with Jerusalem here, is that this is a part of the world where pretty much our New Testament is focused on. But how many of us actually care about modern day Turkey, modern day Syria? I mean, okay, we can deal with Greece and Italy because right, those are great destination spots. But this area where so much of church history is, is really an area that for most of us who are 21st century Americans, if we're honest, we don't really care much about that because that's like badlands, right? That's where all the bad stuff in the world is happening. And we need to understand too, like you see the, the seven yellow dots up there in Asia? Those are the seven churches of Revelation. Look at where they all are. There's not a single one in the USA, right? Sometimes we lose sight of the fact that the world, that God so loved the world, actually includes the rest of the world besides just our country. And so each and every person on the planet, regardless of their background or how they dress or where they're at currently spiritually, are made in the image of God. And so Paul, under the unction of the Spirit, realized that, hey, this gospel message wasn't just for here. (laughs) And the Spirit of the Lord took him. And this is hundreds and thousands of miles traveled in ships without indoor plumbing, back in the day of the chamber pot. The things that God allowed Paul to go through that Paul was willing to go through. Granted, it was just, hey, if you're going to travel at the time, everybody got it. But the fact of the matter is, anybody ever go on a long cruise and get a little seasick? Or been on a cruise where people were getting seasick? Yeah, maybe you didn't, but they did. Imagine being on a ship at this time with all of the animals and the cargo that's being transferred pretty much there, all the smells there. I'm always amazed looking back at this and thinking of details that you don't necessarily pick up because it can be pretty generic, those 14 verses that we just read. When you hear this, and we went from here and we went from here and we went from here. Remember too that this section of two and a half chapters that we're looking at, 19 to 21 and a half, is it's like five years worth of what Paul's life entailed, but this is all that God gave us. And he says, when we had departed from them in verse one, right off the bat, what that's really saying, the translation is better, when we had basically been torn from them, and what's he referring to? He'd just spent 
in chapter 20, all that time with who? The church leaders from Ephesus. Basically that first pastor's conference that he did. When he left them, this was not an easy leave. When he left them, what it's actually saying here in the Greek is that when we had torn ourselves apart, and we saw that, right? They all came down to the edge of the water, them, their kids, their family, and the scene's gonna repeat later in this chapter as we already read. But when they were saying goodbye, this was just not a, hey, see ya, nice, nice, for, thanks for coming, because they knew something. They all knew him. We saw last week, the Holy Spirit had revealed to him, this is the last time you're gonna see this guy. You will not see him on this side of heaven ever again. Ray, I'm sorry. Um, but the question's there. Have any of us had to go through that? It was 10 years ago that my mom, I knew I wasn't, I mean, she was dying, and I knew. It was 10 years ago. And that was, uh, she was the third member of my family within eight months to die. I had a sister die of cancer eight months before my mom. I had a sister die of Lou Gehrig's disease three months after that. Five months later, my mom died. Every single one of those ladies I knew was going to die, and all three of them were major players in my life. And so when I look at these people saying goodbye, this isn't like our normal goodbyes, right? At the end of church today, we're going to say goodbye to a lot of one another, a lot of one another. We're going to say goodbye, and we're just going to take it for granted that we will see these people again. That's not what's going on here. These people are saying goodbye knowing that this is the last time they're going to see this person. And guess what? Because of that, they're extremely sad. They don't want to see it happen. Remember what we saw last week. We're going to see it again. Basically, people are going to say, hey, the Holy Spirit has told us that you're going to die we're never going to see you again, so don't go. Natural human sentiment, right? If you knew somebody was going to go someplace and that was going to cause them their death, wouldn't you tell them, don't go? The Holy Spirit's already revealed it to us. Why would he reveal it to us if he didn't want us to tell you to stop? That's the thought process. But the person who was most centrally in this story, in this picture, knew that part of his life would be his death. He knew he had to go. He didn't know exactly how everything was going to end up. He said that last week. But he knew this, he had to go. Do we understand that, beloved, that the whole process of life also includes this thing that so many people fear called death? And are we ready and willing to walk and to live, letting the will of the Lord be done in our lives, knowing that, hey, I could just as easily be in Buffalo Wild Wings and die, or I could be in the Middle East and die. Both places people die. So when they had torn themselves apart, this Ephesian leadership that was extremely close to Paul, they eventually go through a bunch of places, then they end up in a place called Tyre. Yeah, uh, this was not discount Tyre. This was actually the tire, as in this was one of the main hubs of the world at this time. Extremely, extremely prosperous city, extremely, extremely prosperous uh, because of its trade routes, because of all the people coming there and doing business. And it had been this way for a long time. Anybody Old Testament folk remember Tyre? There was a really cool guy there. I, I love his name, Hiram. Remember King Hiram? Hiram was the guy that basically gave David all the cedar wood for not only his house, but later would give that same type of wood to David's son Solomon to build the temple. And so the pictures that we get in our mind of all these cedars being felled and then floated, all, I mean, anybody ever do any logging here? Any loggers? I'm amazed at all the things that people have done in this small congregation. So no loggers. Any froggers? Anything like that? Okay, well, but yeah. And this picture that we get is that all the way back in the days of David, and even before then, this city at the time when this is happening here, according to secular historians, for over 2,500 years, it had been the bomb diggity city. 
However, we get here in Ezekiel chapter 26, verse 4, uh, God wasn't very happy with them. Ezekiel 26, verse 4, we see this prophesied, and they shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers. This is God speaking. And also scrape the dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. Present day Tyre, about 3,000 people live there, and it's basically been scraped clean thanks to a guy by the name of Alexander the Great who came in and besieged it and basically destroyed it. Their wickedness, even though they were great, had raised to heaven, and God said, I will bring justice to them. And that's what happens. And so this place is very, very important throughout all human history, especially in Matthew 15 and Mark 7. Guess what? We see Jesus come to town. Jesus had to go there. Verse 21, Mark, Matthew 15. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to a region of Tyre and Sidon. And that's probably something, if you've read your Bibles, you'll hear that often they're like twin cities like Minneapolis and St. Paul. Behold, verse 22, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to Jesus saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him saying, send her away for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent to accept to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then she came and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And then Jesus answered and said to her, oh woman, great is your faith, exclamation point. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. See, Tyre was known for many, many things, but from this day forward, it would be known for the fact the day that love came to town. The love came to town, as B.B. King would sing, yeah. When love comes to town. Love came to town, and when you read that, please don't be offended thinking that this, the Lord of the universe is calling this lady and her, fa- and her followers dogs. He's usually an illustration And in this beautiful illustration, guess what? She didn't get offended. She understood it completely. That while you have been sent to the children of Israel, all we need are the scraps of God. And if we can get the scraps of God, it can do amazing things. And Jesus' response to your woman, great is your faith. This morning, be encouraged that a mustard seed of faith is all that is necessary to move mountains according to the one who created the mountains. And do we approach God understanding that, hey, Lord, you can do whatever you want because you're capital L, Lord. Please forgive me, but oftentimes when I'm working with Mike, there'll be a problem. And often when the problem gets solved, he'll go, thank you, Lord. And I'll say, you're welcome. And he'll laugh. And I said, oh, you were talking to the capital L, Lord, right? Yeah, this, it's the God of the universe that we're talking about here, beloved. And this is his heart. His heart is for the lost. And he says very clearly, if you seek me, you will find me. And so Paul here, remember, always remembering that this was Saul, the scourge of the church, is nearing his finish line, not only of his ministry, but also of his life. And he simply wants to end and be found faithful. And so he's going all over the place, all over the world to bring the truth and the good news of Jesus because he understands, as we'll see when we go through the book of Romans, is how is anybody going to know this unless they hear it? No CNN back then, right? No BBC, no Fox News, no nothing. It was all by word of mouth or by letter. And so we see Paul committing himself to taking the good news of Jesus around the world. Verse four, finding disciples. What's that tell us right there? When they went to Tyre, they weren't necessarily aware that there were any disciples there. They weren't necessarily aware that there were actually followers of Jesus there. And they found some. It's like, whoa, this is really cool. 
And this is the beauty of the gospel message. It's going. It's going. It's going. God is constantly taking his good news to a lost and dying world. Whether we're going to be faithful to be doing our part of it or not, guess who is always remaining faithful according to scripture? God is. And he brings his message in ways that people will believe. And we're seeing right now within our own time frame that so many people in the Middle East are getting dreams and visions and they're coming to Christ. Going to sleep, a Muslim, willing to die for their faith, waking up in the morning after having a dream or a vision, now a follower of Jesus, willing to die for Jesus. The message of the gospel is out there and guess what, as we go through life, we find disciples along the way too. I was at uh, my friend's uh, memorial service, his mom, and his mom was a friend too, uh, on Friday, and sure enough, a guy walked in and started talking to him, and it was my friend's childhood friend, and the childhood friend begins to tell him, about, you know, I'm a Christian now, and my friend obviously was taken aback, like, what? You? <laughs> it's one of those types of situations, right? And sure enough, that guy, like four months ago, had given his life to the Lord, and he had a very bad background, very bad past. But guess what? He'd come to faith in Christ. Finding disciples when we go around sure is fun, isn't it? Isn't there something too about meeting other believers that it's kind of awkward in the sense of like you meet somebody for the first time that's a follower of Jesus and you feel extremely close and then immediately you're taken back to the people that you grew up with in your blood family? I met this person five minutes ago and I feel closer to them than some of my blood family that I've known for 50 years. Interesting, huh? Well, that is the communion of the Spirit. That's the affirmation of the Spirit letting us know, hey, well, you're going to spend eternity with this person. This person's forever family. And these disciples that we come across, we want to hang out. We want a fellowship. I love that today it is the message lands right here and later this afternoon. Um, for those who wish to come out and go to the Thomases, we'll have our bring and bless. And we're actually going to get to dunk somebody, which we'll talk about in a little bit here too. They found these disciples, and these disciples, uh, basically out of love and being well-intentioned, what do they tell them? Yeah, t don't go. Jerusalem's just all bad.com for you right now, bro. Don't go there, right? But he's got to go. He has to go. So what happens? <laughs> they knelt down on the shore and prayed. After a week of hanging out and fellowshipping, the wives, the kids all come, and it's chapter 20, take two, a very moving, emotional time because they basically all know that, hey, we got to meet the guy, we got to see him face to face, and now we're not going to see him on this side of earth again. But I find something rather interesting here when we look at this. In verse 5, where were they when they knelt down and prayed? on the shore, outside, in the public, probably other people around, looking over and saying, wow, check out that group of people over there on their, that group of short people, right? You know, well, no, they're, right? They're, no, they're on there. Wow, that's kind of interesting. What are they doing there? Uh, public prayer. How many of us love it when you're at a restaurant and you actually see somebody like before they eat, actually take the time either to, if they're alone, maybe they bow their head, or if they're together, they grab hands, maybe they pray out loud. I love it. I'm not necessarily sure who they're praying to, but the fact that they are at least openly, publicly acknowledging that there is power, greatness that we need to literally give thanks for, I believe it's something that God wants us to do. It's a simple way, because I know when I see people do it, I will begin a conversation with them when they're done. I will thank them, and then I'll find out, you know, who they're praying to. And 99% of the time, they're praying to Jesus. Other times, not. It's like, oh, nice, let's have a talk, right? But this, um, uh, this understanding of that as we are called to be the light means we're not the light just in our own homes. It's wherever we go. And I'm not saying that you, if you're not doing this already, that you're messing up. I'm just saying that there's opportunities for us to shine even when 
we don't necessarily even realize it. Because even though somebody may not say something to you when they see it, it's sowing seeds. It's watering seed. Because we're in a day and age to where what used to be common like that is it common anymore? Oh gosh, no, it's not. The country's going away from its foundational principles of submission to God. But Paul's here doing his thing, going around. He's being called to go and he's being faithful to go. In verse seven, they got done with their voyage from Tyre. Then they come down to Ptolemaeus, greeted the brethren and stayed there for one day. Uh, Ptolemaeus is like, you look at it on, on the map, it's just not necessarily anything there. And you look it up in the history books, there's not a whole lot there either. It's just close to Tyre. But the fact that it's mentioned here in scripture, I always think that, hey, God gave a little shout out to Ptolemaeus. Why? There's, there's people, yeah, there's believers there, right? They'd finished their voyage, came and told us, greeted brethren. And even though they only got one day with Paul versus Tyre getting seven, the fact of the matter is what's seemingly insignificant to us and to historians is extremely important to the God of the universe. We must never forget that the God of the universe is what? Infinite. And if he's infinite, can he ever be burdened? Can we ever say to ourselves, I have a problem, but God is so busy with everything else. I mean, oftentimes we do that though, don't we? We need to be childlike in these instances to where, you know how children will come in and you're in the midst of a conversation with somebody and the kid just immediately goes into their need, you know, because you're daddy, you're mommy. And granted, we teach them manners on how to say, excuse me, and when they're learning how to do that, they usually come in, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> they have a little trouble with that waiting part. But when we're dealing with the God of the universe, you know, we don't have to come in and say, excuse me, because he can multitask to the infinite level because of who he is. And so we need to understand that what is seemingly insignificant to us, to God, it's important. And the fact that we will have the faith to say, God, I need your help. Even in the smallest of things, what's it do? It honors him. Why? Because it reveals you've got faith. Why? Because you're talking to the God that you can't see. Our empirical senses don't tell us that God is there. It's faith. And faith honors him. Acting in faith honors him. Without faith, it's impossible, according to scripture, what? To please him. Because we must believe that he exists, even though we don't see him. And for many people, that's always a tough one, but it's like, well, we all believe in the wind, right? Right? especially in Pueblo West, right? You believe in the wind, you Cyclones fans, way to go, state champions, right? Baseball, woo -hoo! But the fact of the matter is we understand and we know for sure that wind is there because we see the effects of the wind. We all believe in oxygen and air, right? Because if it's not there, we know that we die. We've never seen it, but yet we see the effects of it. And so God has made it very clear. He's there. He's here. Will we respond appropriately? Verse eight, we continue on. We who are Paul's companions. We know that the physician Luke is the one who's writing this and certain times in Acts, uh, the narrative kind of drops to they because he's gone and somebody else picks up the story. But whenever he's writing, he's telling it's we. But they're Paul's companions. Yeah. It's his barcada, it's his group of friends. It's the people in his life that are doing life with Paul. And these companions had to go to a certain different place. And they went to a place to Caesarea. Now, you'll hear Caesarea often in the New Testament, and there's two. Because basically Caesarea on the Galilee is where Jesus set up his kind of headquarters during his ministerial life. This is not that Caesarea. This is what is known as Caesarea Maritima, which is right there uh, on the coast underneath of the two cities that we just looked at. But while they're there at Caesarea Maritima, we find somebody by the name of Philip the Evangelist. In all of scripture, Philip is the only person 
that is actually labeled the evangelist. He's the only one that is acknowledged as having that actual office in scripture. And when I'm talking about office, this is what I'm talking about in Ephesians chapter four, beginning at verse 11, he says this, and God himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth and love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Paul was the king of the run-on sentence, right? For those of you, or Susie, you, you teachers, right? If one of your students wrote something like this, you're going to say like, well, you can put a whole lot of periods in there. Reality of it is uh, communication and language has changed, but the fact of the matter in this that I'm trying to point out is that God, according to scripture, has given positions for people to fill. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, but it's all for one purpose, for the equipping of the saints and to equip the saints to help us all to grow to be more like Jesus. That's what that verses 11 to 16 basically boil down to. But in all of scripture, Philip's the only one who's listed as Philip the evangelist. Evangelism is extremely important, extremely important, so much so that it's not left for just the people who fill the office to do. Paul would write later to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, but you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Evangelism is part of everybody who calls themselves a disciple or a follower of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the great commission in Matthew 28 was to us all, which says this, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. When Jesus gave his great commission, it wasn't just to the pastors, the apostles, the evangelists, those that are in those roles. It's to everybody. So if anybody is a follower of Christ, guess what? The process of making disciples means you have to tell people the gospel. And simply sharing the gospel is called evangelism. It's bringing the good news. And so we're all commissioned to do this. And part of that process is that people hear the good news, believe the good news, and what's the very first act of obedience that people who believe the good news are called to do? Be baptized. To make a public profession of your faith through baptism. And baptism to many people nowadays may seem strange. You're going to go get in a, some type of water whether it be a pool, I've done them in jacuzzis, um, I've done them in raging rivers, uh, some type of water, you're going to go allow yourself to kind of be pushed under the water and you're hopeful the minister's gonna bring you back up, right? And this is all, why? Because it's an act of obedience. But the act of obedience has this beautiful big picture, right? That going under the water is basically like going into the tomb, according to what Paul would write later. That you are signifying that with Christ we died, with Christ we were buried, and that with Christ when we come up out of the water, we've risen. And that it's the symbol of a new person. It's a symbol of a new beginning. And so Chris was all, you know, all excited to, well, maybe you're not, but we're excited, right? It'll be, it'll be, yeah, it's one of those things to where it's simply being obedient to what God has called us to do. And this is part of Jesus' great commission. So that's why we do it. We're simply trying to be obedient. 
And how many of us have trouble with being obedient, period? Humanity. We want to do it our way. When we see Jesus washing the feet of the disciples, Peter, got to love Peter, right? Never will you wash my feet, Lord. Because from his understanding, that's what's reserved for the lowest of the low, and you're my rabbi, and I'm not going to be the guy who's got a rabbi that's washing people's feet. Peter, if I don't do this, you have no part with me. Then not just my feet, my head, everything. It's like, we're so much like Peter. We're the Burger King generation. Everything has to be our way. No, come to Christ and do things his way. Submit. This first act of obedience is called throughout Scripture and recorded throughout Scripture and recorded throughout church history. And this Philip, he's one of the seven. Do you remember back in Acts chapter 6, verse 5? This isn't Philip, the, one of the 12 disciples. This is a different Philip. In Acts chapter 6, verse 5, he was what we referred to as, well, I referred to as one of the magnificent seven Yeah, when they were looking for people to serve, he was one of the seven that was chosen. Overshadowed by a guy by the name of Stephen, right, in one sense. But the fact of the matter, this is one of the guys that when they were looking for early church leaders simply to serve the people, he was one of the seven that was chosen. And he's still walking strong with the Lord and God's blessed him. And he's got four virgin daughters who are prophesying. He's got four daughters that are basically speaking the oracles of God. What an interesting household that would have been, huh? Hey, um, we don't get their names, we don't know anything, but, but he, hey, Salome, would you go take the garbage out? Well, the, the Lord told me that my sister, it's her turn, you know? It's like, how did that work out? We don't know, There's, we're not given anything in that. But the fact of the matter is that the Spirit of God was moving in this family. And as the Spirit of God is moving among them, Guess what happens? Another spirit-filled person shows up on the scene in verse 10, a guy by the name of Agabus. Everybody say Agabus. Uh, Saturday morning. No, Friday morning. uh, The house that I stayed at when I was in San Diego had our, uh, some of our grandkids, had the eldest. And so she's eight, she's a 4-H girl. She's got goats and chickens, and now she's got two pigs that she's raising for 4-H. And she's got chores in the morning, but she has school, so she gets up and does her chores before she goes to school. Well, she knew I had got in late the night before, so she got up early to get her chores done early in hopes that we could hang out. Uh, She's a doll. Her name's Charlie, and we're super close. And sure enough, I wake up, to hearing her outside doing her chores, and I look at the clock, and it's 5.45, and I'm like, wow. Her dad walks out a couple minutes later and goes, oh, good, you're awake. She got up to do her chores early, hoping that you'd be awake so she could spend time with you. So she comes in after doing her chores, and I'm reading my Bible, and she kind of walks over, and she turns, I can see her slowly, she peeks around the corner, she goes, Papa, you're awake. She comes over, jumps on my lap, and snuggles under me, and we just hug. And then she goes, Papa, I got a new toy. You want to see our new toy? And so she goes and grabs me a toy, and she brings it to me. and goes, oh, honey, that's not a toy. That's an abacus. And I'm going, it's actually like an ancient calculator that you can do addition and subtraction and multiplication and division on. She goes, it's not a toy? I said, no. And I literally go to YouTube and type in abacus, and what's it pull up? The exact same colored abacus as we have right there. The exact same one. And so we spend the next half an hour learning together how to do an abacus. And she goes to school that morning and tells her teacher, my papa taught me how to use an abacus. You know, she comes home and says, my, my teacher didn't know what an abacus was. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we all remember it, but how many of us can actually say we know how to use one, right? Why would we want to know how to use one, right? We have these things called calculators, right? And we have them on our phones. But abacus and algebus, right? This guy, the prophet Abacus, that's how I always remember this guy, but it's actually Agabus. In Acts chapter 11, do you remember when we were going through that? He prophesied that there was a great famine that was going to happen, and guess what happened? It happened. Biblical standards for prophets, 100%, or you're not one. And in the Old Testament times, if you ever predicted something that you're saying that God said that this was going to happen, and it didn't, 
You know what they did to you? So do you. It was not something that you took on lightly to say, hey, God told me that this was going to happen. On such and such a date, this was going to happen. No, it was something that, boy, you only shared that when you were sure because if you were wrong, bye-bye. This guy comes into town and after spending some time with them, what's he do? He shares something that the Lord reveals to him and he takes Paul's belt and he wraps it around his hands. And he says, thus, the man who owns this is going to have happened to him in Jerusalem. And not only are they going to do it to him there, the whole purpose that they're going to do it to him there is they're going to deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And can't wait to see the DVDs of this, right? To see how everybody replies. Because if we were in a situation right now where somebody walked in off the street, they said, hey, I know this guy. Hey, what's going on, John the prophet? And John the prophet walks over and Chaz, give me your belt. I didn't wear one today. <laughs> I'm lying, here it is. And he does that. And he says, thus was going to happen. What would we all do? What would you all do? And you'd all hope, hopefully you'd all hope that number one, he's a false prophet. Number two, it's like, oh man, you know what? Somebody just pops up, I had a dream about this. Somebody else says, the Lord shared this when I was reading my Bible the other day. I thought it was weird that he was telling me why you're going to be bound up, Chaz, but now I get it, right? And there's confirmation. And when this happens, everybody, verse 12, they pleaded, don't go to Jerusalem. Here's the solution. If the problem is awaiting you in Jerusalem, just don't go. But the ministry was waiting for him in Jerusalem. God's appointment for him to go on to be his ambassador was waiting for him in Jerusalem. And it's interesting here where Paul, in his humanity, kind of chides them. What are you guys, you guys are killing me. You're killing me, Smalls. You're, stop, stop, stop crying, stop doing all this stuff because it's just breaking my heart as well. And there are times that we have to remember. There's times that we can share and vent our feelings, and there's times that we really have to rein them in. I, I, I've, I've, I've never spoken at a funeral that I've officiated that I haven't cried. And sometimes I didn't even really know the person. I knew their kids. But there's something about being in a room full of people who are saddened over the loss of a loved one that just, I guess I'm a big baby, right? You know, whatever, however you want to see it. But the fact of the matter is, I know that I can't get up there and cry for 15 minutes straight, though. I have to be able to kind of rein it in. It's interesting, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 29, verse 11, we see this, a fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. There are times when you can gush and there's times when you kind of have to close off the spigot, pull up your bootstraps and move on for what God has for you right there. Paul's telling them right now, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly encouraged by what you're doing. It's just helping me to be even more sad. But then here's the rock bottom understanding he has. I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul was sold out. He knew that he knew that he knew that he was just going to continue to serve Jesus as long as God gave him life. And if it was to die in Jerusalem, then so be it. Who else died in Jerusalem? The guy he's following and sometimes we kind of lose sight with the fact that if Jesus calls us to follow him, and what does he say first before even following him? We deny ourselves and then do what? Pick up our cross. What's that cross symbolic of? Not nice jewelry. It's the fact of if we're going to follow him, eventually it leads to death. But doesn't all of life eventually lead to death anyways? So why don't we do it in a sense where we're actually following the one who gives us life, knowing that death is just the beginning. 
And that's the thing that's the most amazing for me as being a disciple and a follower of Jesus is to know that death is not the end. It's actually the beginning. And it's not just like the beginning of phase two or for you Marvel fans of phase four, right? It's actually the beginning of real life. And that's where for so long we have been brainwashed into thinking that everything that we can see, touch, taste, that this is actually the real world. This is temporal. This is passing. It's the kingdom of heaven that's forever. It's the spiritual realm that is the forever world. Hence the reason why we're only here for a short time. But are we prepared for that everlasting world? Paul was. He knew he was living on borrowed time. In essence, don't we all realize that? Or shouldn't we all? None of us is going to stay on this planet forever. We're going to die or we're going to fly. And when that day happens, while many others will grieve, guess what you're going to be doing? You guys really shouldn't be grieving. (laughs) Because where I am right now, oh my. And in one sense, some of the theologians believe that when you get there, it's not like you're going to be waiting for everybody else, is that it's outside of time. It's that when you get there, it's already done in that realm. That's kind of a mind blower for you today on your Sunday afternoon to contemplate, yeah? But our reality is, do we understand, like Paul, that we're willing and ready to wherever it is that we would die for the name of the Lord Jesus? And so in verse 14, so when he would not be persuaded, all of us ceased, and we said, the will of the Lord be done. You'll hear this often, and often you'll ask yourselves this, and sometimes people will ask you, you're a Christian, how do I know what the will of the Lord is? And while there are many books written on the subject, I think it can be simply surmised from what we have in Scripture. In one sense, you can look at it from Jesus' words and say, what did Jesus say? The work of God is to do what? Believe in him whom he sent. That's a pretty simple one. If you'll believe in Jesus, then the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you into all truth. It's a matter of simply following. And so then you do your best along the way to kind of figure out what the will of the Lord is. But then we also have this passage in Scripture that I find very helpful in times like these. For some reason, let it be just stuck, just jumped into my head right now. You know, because when I find myself in times of trouble, I don't go to Mother Mary, I go to Scripture. And this is what the scripture tells me in Ephesians chapter 5. Paul would write under the unction of the Spirit, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Does that sound like today? The world hasn't changed in a couple thousand years. Verse 17, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Guess what? He continues on. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation or excessiveness, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now, you can go and get a theological dictionary and see all the different types and the classifications of the will of God, the permissive will, the declarative will, on and on and on and on. But I think when we come to Scripture, I think this is a very practical working definition of what the will of God is. What is it? To be filled with the Spirit, the last part of verse 18. And to be filled with the Spirit means what? Basically, to go through life being joy-filled, loving God, and telling others about him. And being thankful. I mean, does that not seem like to everybody else? Okay, so the will of the Lord isn't necessarily something that is out in the you know, left field, up in the, in the bleachers, that I've got to go searching and digging for, and maybe I actually have to crawl up there on my knees on broken glass to a wise person and get it. No, I think it's pretty simple. And it even goes back into Old Testament. He's shown thee, O man, Micah 6, 8, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee. 
but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. This relationship aspect of being a disciple and a follower of Jesus, it's the will of the Lord. And as that is put as the umbrella for our life, then all these little things along the way and these little decisions we have to make, if they're subjugated to that, guess what? They fall in line. And they definitely are put into perspective. And that's the big one right there. All of the little things that we sweat over, that we worry over, that we lose sleep over, oh my goodness, God bless you. Submit them to the overarching umbrella of this. Am I walking with God? Am I simply enjoying his presence? Am I simply doing my best to listen as his Holy Spirit's leading me and guiding me into all truth? Because if I'm doing that, okay. And guess what? If we're not doing it, don't we know? Don't we know? We do. The question is, are we listening and simply yielding? Because the will of the Lord specifically there and the will of the Lord in general is right there. Listen to what Jesus said, and this is where we're going to close today. In Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Remember this one? The answer to the lawyer that was trying to trick him on what's the greatest commandment of them? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Bonus round. You only asked me for the greatest, but I'll tell you the second. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbors yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The will of the Lord be done. Love him. And everything else is going to fall in line. And you're going to be led to the decisions that you need to make about the little things that are going on in life. And if you have any questions about it, take it to him. And if you're still unsure, that's why the rest of us are here. And isn't it good to have friends who you can take your questions to and they can answer them for you and point you to scripture and say, well, this is what I see scripture says. And that's the beauty of it all, beloved. We're not trying to force anybody to do anything. We're trying to make you disciples of us. When Crystal gets baptized, she's not getting baptized into Freedom Calvary. She's getting baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's a, she's getting baptized into the family of Christ worldwide and history-wide. Yeah, it's happening at a local congregation, but we can't save you. We can't save anybody. We point people to Jesus. And beloved, understand, his will is that people would come to know him. And we do not have the responsibility to force people to believe. We can't. Could anybody force us when we were non-believers? All we can do is share it. And if you share it, like we share about so many other things that we love, guess what? Well, there's a good chance that eventually that seed will bear good fruit. But if we share it because I've got to get this done for my quota for the day. People know you ain't believe in that. And so share out of the abundance of what God has done for you. As we saw there in Ephesians chapter four, thanking him. And there's so much for us to be thankful for. And so, Father, we're thankful this morning for you, and we desire that your will would be done, that the will of the Lord would be done. And, God, we're thankful for the opportunities that you give us to share the good news. That's such great news just to hear of how (coughs) Ray took that opportunity, and I know he does it frequently, with the people who are his passengers to tell them about Jesus. They get in. He's got his Christian music playing. There's things that we can do to set the stage to bring the truth and the beauty and the joy of you to others. And so help us, Lord. Not everybody has circumstances at work that allow for a couple of hour conversations, but Lord, all of us have the opportunity to unconditionally love, to serve, to do things that would help others to see your reality. And thank you, Lord, for bringing your reality 
so much closer to us today. Help us to respond in a way that would bring you honor and glory.